This is not how this new series was supposed to begin, but I couldn't think of any other way to present it. A Writer Writes is the result of conversations I had with my biggest fan and most ardent supporter around the time of her 58th birthday. She was my proofreader and my sounding board, helping me to process and streamline thoughts that often came out as an avalanche of ideas. She was a writer in her own right, pending poems, novels, short stories, songs, and scripts that made it to the eyes of very few outside a select circle of family and friends. But most importantly, aside from being a muse and a constant source of encouragement, she was my mother. And we lost her to cancer on January 23rd, 2021. Carrie meant so many things, and was so many things, to so many people. She was a friend, a confidant, a daughter, a sibling, an aunt, cousin, source of incredible love and support, and a champion for those who struggle to speak for themselves, because everyone deserves to be loved, and nobody is without the capacity to be loved. But the role of mother and grandmother is one that defined her and was the source of her greatest work in life. She raised us to be kind, patient, open-minded, tolerant, loving, accepting, and good people, cast very much in her own image. It was in her nature to nurture, and she gave of herself selflessly to the aid of others. But there was nothing that she would not do nor sacrifice of herself for her children. She loved and supported all of us endlessly and extended that love and support to all of our friends and significant others we brought home. You are all my kids, she used to say. Her life's work was to work and the job was never done. On her second to last night, through the pain and the medication, she still managed to get a nurse to write down a grocery list for her. A list that, based on its contents, is for us on the day that we get together to remember her, as it includes her favorite items for a summer barbecue. She was such a beautiful and remarkable soul, unfortunately installed in such an unreliable human frame. But despite the fact it only gave her 58 short years, she accomplished more in that time and spread more unconditional love and support than someone who lived for twice that. While she leaves behind a hole that will never be filled, her legacy alone overflows it. And the love you feel in your heart is her voice singing softly, letting you know that everything's gonna be okay. I was there with her at 9.24 p.m. when she drew her last breath. I held her hand. I told her that we all loved her and that it was okay for her to leave, that she accomplished everything she needed to do, and that her father, her brother, Mickey, and Phyllis, Uncle Larry, her grandmother, Christy, and so many other people who loved her so much were waiting for her and couldn't wait to see her again. I turned on Bohemian Rhapsody and held her hand and sang along softly, just telling her that I loved her and that her work was done. When the song ended, I kissed her forehead and said, I love you, Mama. All of us do. And we will be with you always. I sat there with her a moment longer while she lay in tranquility, no longer struggling, no longer suffering, cuddled up on a mountain of pillows with Sully the Sloth by her side. She went peacefully, with absolute grace and dignity, surrounded by love. 
carried off into the next life on a last breath as gentle as an autumn breeze. I would not be here today hosting this podcast and launching a writer rights without her. Watching her work inspired me to write as a child, but you'll hear more about my own story in a later episode. She was prolific and profound in her prose, but she rarely ever shared her work outside the curious eyes of her kids and a few close, chosen friends. For her, writing was about the process, about creating art. It wasn't a want, it was a need. A need to tell a story that was going on in her mind. The characters were not fictional. They were living, breathing beings in their own universe. And she was merely there to document. I know because we think the same way. We write the same way. And with her passing, I inherit an incredible body of unpublished work from the raw to the ready. Work that deserves to be shared. Work that deserved to be shared when she was with us. But work that I can only hope will shine a light on the incredible mind, shining soul, and indomitable talent that she was. A Writer Writes is intended to be a conversation series where we discuss the craft of writing with the authors themselves. But in this instance, we have to make do without that direct insight. I wish I had gotten the chance to document one of our countless conversations around writing, but I never did. So here are her words and words of remembrance as we process the loss of an incredible artistic soul, told in guest voices, new and familiar to stories telling stories, sharing in the compassion, admiration, and love that Carrie dedicated her life to putting out into the world. We love you, Mama. And we'll never forget that a writer writes always. In Ireland, it's tradition to have a, a wake, a kind of funeral. And at a wake, uh, you do th two things you get drunk um, and you celebrate the life of the person who's passed so I can not can neither get no drunk because I have no open alcohol but I can cheers uh, and and toast to I'm sure a wonderful person who Eric has lost so if everyone will raise a glass um wherever you are in the world to Eric and to Carrie if she's listening you raised a wonderful son who is such an incredible part of this pack uh, and of this group of friends you <laughs> did your job as a mother and a person who was a part of your family I'm sure an incredibly important part of your family to an amazing degree and I'm sure I speak for the whole pack to say that uh, we will grieve your loss along with Eric even if we've never got the pleasure or chance to meet you so to carry to the wonderful life she led and to the people she's unfortunately had to leave behind <laughs> Shlancha we will miss you we will grieve you <sighs> to carry So what? I hear the wind blow as snow circles outside, 
Pulling the blanket tighter, I think of warmer days. A commercial comes on TV, telling me I should want to go back in time and be younger. But do I want that? Youngering myself would come at a cost. What exactly the price, I'm not sure, but if it meant change of who I am, what I've learned, of where I've come or where I plan to go, then no. I've grown a lot from love, from pain, and mothering, and daughtering, and sistering, and friending. It hasn't always been fun, or nice, or painless, especially not painless. Lately, I have witnessed change in the world, in kindness, and lack thereof. People pulling themselves up by pushing others down. People lifting one up by the hand while kicking out another's feet. People laughing in joy at another's misfortune. I wonder where we went wrong. When did that left turn at Albuquerque occur? And can we ever truly expect to actually arrive at our chosen destination? But then again, maybe I'm already there. Now I'm warm, so I loosen up my grip on the blanket. The wind still cries and the snow still swirls, but the thought of it no longer chills me. So the world chooses to be cruel. So what? I can choose to be kind. And if I'm a target, so what? I don't need to deflect or reflect or react in negativity. I can choose kindness and caring. Sure, it will still hurt, but my hurting back would hurt more. Me and others, kicking you would still hurt my toe. I flick off the TV, lay on my back, studying the dark ceiling. I wonder if the changes I've noted weren't changes in the world at all. Maybe they've been there all along, but I chose to avoid seeing them. Hmm. I sigh, shrug, roll onto my side. Would I want to go back in time in order to enjoy once more my now lost, misguided view of a kinder, more perfect world? Maybe not. Probably not. I've grown. And true, growth is not without pain. Do I like that the world is not how I once viewed it? that cruelty is the new in color, that winter's chill has sort of filled my soul with melancholy? Not really. But then again, so what? Strength. In my mind's eye, I can still smell the sickly sweetness of carnations, all but suffocating me as I walked into the overly air-conditioned parlor. There in the middle of the room was a box, wooden with brass handles, Mickey's forever bed. The lid was closed and sealed. I shivered as I stood there, taking in the casket and the flowers and the steady hum of voices from the next room. People passed, speaking among themselves, not noticing the awkward 12-year-old alternately staring at and then away from her dead brother's box. Never had I felt so utterly alone. Perhaps I should go into the next room with the gathered guests, fellow mourners, relatives, and family friends, my remaining siblings. I glanced around the corner and caught sight of my uncle, who was relaying to another details of identifying my brother's body to save my mother the grief. I shrank back into the middle room, wrapping my arms around my skinny, shivering torso, biting the inside of my cheek to keep the tears from coming. Moments later, I felt a hand on my arm. 
Looking up, I saw my cousin Matt, and beside him, my cousin Sean. Matt smiled his crooked smile, nodding toward the door and said, let's get out of here. The, the three of us walked through the huge wooden doorway, taking seats on the front step of the funeral home. The sun's heat was a welcome relief after the frigid air of the parlor. I sat in the middle, Matt on one side of me and Sean on the other. For several minutes, the two boys talked, not about the flowers or the casket or my brother's drowning death or anything in particular. Teen stuff, music and TV shows and stupid things that they had done. They didn't ask me questions or expect me to add to the conversation. They, they let me be, keeping watch over me and providing comfort in the only way that 12 and 13 year olds know how. They somehow knew they couldn't fix things or make this craziness make any sense, so they didn't even try. After a while, my sister found us and told me that I needed to go in and see my mother. I did go in again, but this time it wasn't quite so horrifying. I followed my sister, my cousins followed me. There was strength in numbers, strength in support, and strength in two teenage boys, my sweet cousins, and that strength is what got me through one of the toughest days of my life. Solstice. So many years have passed, but still this song affects me. Especially on this, the longest day of the year. The day we lost you. Larry to some, Mickey to me, you remain a part of the fabric of my life. I have not had a day in over 44 years that you haven't crossed my mind. You frequent my dreams and thoughts and reality. I loved you. I still love you. You remain a daily vision burned into my brain. To borrow a line from Elton, must be the clouds in my eyes. My Eric has a lot of Mickey's characteristics. He is smart and kind and funny and musical. They both have blue eyes and, <laughs> this just occurred to me, both had broken their front teeth when they were younger. Huh, how about that? Isn't it wonderful to see those common characteristics it kind of hurts and feels good at the same time. Something I've never told anyone because we never viewed the body. I spent years half not believing he was dead. I told myself either there had been a mistake or that he had run away. Any way to cope, I guess. Losing Mickey was why I was so withdrawn when I started junior high. I suppose everyone in 7R group thought that I was either really stuck up or painfully shy. I don't know that I said three words in that class I didn't need to that year. I was in shock still. It took years to crawl back out of my shell of grief and feel like me again. Friends by Carrie Baker. Some days are beautiful despite the rain. Some days we feel fine despite the pain. Sometimes we get by despite the fear but other times we find it feels all too near. Someday I will rise and the sun will shine. 
that will be a day I know is mine. Somehow, all the cloudiness inside my head will roll away as easy as rolling out of bed. Someday, all the tears inside will finally dry. There will be no further reason left to cry. Someday, my loneliness will drift away. Honestly, I can't wait for that wonderful day. Until, until, until that day, I'll try to keep on smiling throughout the fray. I'll close my heart, my eye and mind to the negativity I should leave behind. I should hold up my hand to quell the din and simply not let all that sickness in. In fact, I should open up, scream and shout, do what I need to do to get the awfulness out. If I can hear the music, I can sing the song. But how can it be honest if the lyrics are wrong? The words that run in circles inside my brain can't help but make me wonder if they're causing the pain. All alone in darkness, all alone in light, sometimes daytime seems much bleaker than the night. But no matter how it starts, no matter how it ends, it is always somehow easier when we can share it with our friends. Dice. Silence fills the hours between treatments and down days and up days and illness. The rumble of passing cars heard beneath the covers of the sickbed only remind of those whose lives are not married by disease. Those whose lives proceed as they always have, passing from dreams to wakefulness, from standing to walking, from today to tomorrow, with a rhythmic smoothness unlike an endless void. Decisions entail coffee or decaf, salad or sandwich, red shirt or blue pants, rather than if Tylenol or oxymorphone are the most appropriate to handle this pain. Smiles pasted on faces hide the quivering questions of how long this all can be tolerated. How many more times the Russian roulette of treatment will continue to hide the bullet of too much and too long and too sick and too painful before expelling itself and sinking into cancered flesh, keeping hospital stays at bay to preserve some sense of normalcy in an abnormal situation becomes key in combination to some form of sanity, sanctity, survivability amid the death march of metastatic monopoly, a game without a get out of treatment free card the only railroads leading to abandoned tracks of what once was and will never be again. Life of peace and hope and plans and futures to a life where life is not so much a gamble as a sure thing, an ace in the hand rather than a scratch off lottery ticket, a game you must play in order to ultimately lose. This is a poem I wrote right after I was diagnosed with cancer. It's called Unwelcome Guest. Where did you come from? When did you arrive? What do you have against me not wanting me alive? You crept in oh so silent. I never heard your approach. Like a mouse in the pantry or a nasty cockroach. Now it's time for the face off. I have a team on my side. When the smoke clears the arena, only one of us will be alive. You cause me pain and torment. I will bring you poison and heat. We will fight until someone surrenders and lowers their eyes in defeat. You keep on growing and eating. I'll keep on taking the pain of radiation and chemotherapy until you are no more again. You don't scare me, my pretty. Well, maybe, but only a bit. Because I know that I will defeat you. You can sure count on it. Many years in the future, I'll look back upon this day 
and remembered that you were inside me and chose me a rival to play. But although you are the question, you will not be found with the answer. Because with everything I have within me, I'll obliterate you. Dreadful Cancer. Someday, probably not in my lifetime, cancer will no longer be thought of with such fear. People will receive the diagnosis as a nuisance, as opposed to a death sentence. Cures will be simple and attainable, rather than costly and uncertain. Elders will tell horror stories about old-fashioned cancer treatments, and children will shudder and only half believe talk of radiation, chemotherapy, cutting into the human body to help extend a patient's life. Someday, probably not in my lifetime, the walk for life will be commemorative of past battles rather than current wars against a horrific opponent. Bells ringing for the end of somebody's treatment will be quaint memories, as all will be expected to survive the malady. Someday, probably not in my lifetime, we won't cry as little bald-headed children cross the television screen, begging for funds to help find a cure. Parents won't have to plan funerals for their babies, who have succumbed to tumors. Someday, probably not in my lifetime, my children's children will have to ask why there are orange Team Carry bracelets and Cancer Walk t-shirts stuffed in an old trunk in the attic. What was the big deal about supporting someone with cancer? Why the colorful cancer ribbons? Why do old people sometimes cry when they think about having lost a loved one to cancer decades before? Someday, probably not in my lifetime, what I'm experiencing today will not even be a consideration for somebody diagnosed with cancer. My battle will be forgotten. And that's okay. That's what I want for the future. The cancer nightmare will fade into the subconscious and life will go on as it should. Without a monster known as cancer lurking in the closet, waiting to pounce and destroy someone's life. I don't want others to experience what I have. And someday, they won't. But probably not in my lifetime. Facebook earlier. I listened to it and listened to it and now I can't get it out of my head. So what ended up happening is I ended up having some words come that went along with it. So I just jotted them down and ended up with lyrics to your rift. Um, I was going to just forward the lyrics to you but then I thought well, it probably would make more sense if the music that's in my head was included with this. So I'm going to give this a shot and um, see if I can replicate what's going on in my head. And um, I want to apologize. My voice is scratchy. It's kind of late. It's uh, about 11.30 on Saturday. So here goes. <clears throat> Rain falling down. I can't imagine what you're going through. It's one of those inevitabilities that we all face with our parents. 
but I, I can't and I, I suppose I don't want to even begin to imagine what you're going through right now. Um, but you have crossed my mind and my parents asked about you, um, obviously after they saw the beautiful video of your mom. But you're such a good dude and um, you're so creative and you've inspired me a lot. So um, I hope you know that. Um, and obviously you're well beloved in the community as well, which is like really cool, really, really cool. Um, yeah, you're charismatic, even textually. So uh, just know that you're worth so much to a lot of people and that we're all thinking of you and all the energy is coming at you from around the world, however cheesy that sounds. Um... Less than perfect. Ever wish you'd been perfect? That every decision you had made in your past had been the right one? that all the wrong things you said or did or thought or gave that you now regret could change to the right stuff. I guess all I can say is I tried to be a good person. I tried to be kind and honest and loving and fair. I never went out of my way to be mean or spiteful to anyone. I tried to see the best in everyone. I loved my children fiercely and still do. My family was always precious to me, my friends, even those not particularly friendly, I tried to show compassion and treat with respect. But I wasn't perfect. I made mistakes. I make mistakes. I speak without thinking. I don't always let things go like I should. I let feelings cloud my judgment and I judge, although I of all people have no right to. To any I have wronged, I'm sorry. To any I've offended, I'm sorry. To my kids, who I tried to be all things for and tried to do my best for and still managed to be less than perfect for, I apologise for my shortcomings. It's probably pretty vain of me to consider that I could ever reach perfection, but I guess I can always strive for better. As you read this, no, I love you. No, I understand how hard this life can be. How easy it is to mess things up and how tough it can be to be. I will never be perfect, not even close. And this imperfection saddens me, but my fellows, my friends, my family, my sweet children know this. In my eyes, you will always be, in your own ways, be perfect by Carrie Baker.